I'm Jane, Jane Griffiths, and I live in Finnefort. I'm Sandy Brunton, and I also live in Finnefort, but in a different place. So my grandfather got the fishing here after his lease was terminated at the Karsig fishing. So he, he got the lease from the Iona community from uh, Dr George MacLeod at Camas and he then established the fishing here. So he he's my mother's mother. Mother's father. Sorry, mother's father. What brought me down to Camas was uh, Bertie asked me if I'd like to do the fishing with him. And uh, I came down to check it out. What? I was working at the petrol station at the time. The Camus fishing was well known. Bertie would be your... Uncle by marriage. Uncle by marriage. And he'd been fishing down here for goodness knows. And most of the, most of the young men of Benesson and Finnefer had worked down here at some point or another for the summer fishing season. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was great. It was great. It was, it was, Bertie was fantastic to work with. He didn't actually teach you anything, but you sure learnt a lot. I don't think we had roles. We did the fishing together. So there, were, there was also, there was various other people at the time. I was, he used to fish with a lovely guy called Willie, Willie Wood from Benesson. But he was getting on a wee bit then. So uh, they always had additional strength. So I was the additional strength. You can't fish the nets on your own. You have to have at least two people, really, to fish a net properly. We had four different nets. The point on the east, that was called the boys' net, and that was the easiest net to fish in that it had the least strain on the lines, because when the tide was running, the lines on the net would get very taut, and you wouldn't be able to fish the net. You'd have to wait for the tide to drop so you could fish it. So here's lots screwed, and this is Camus in here. I think on that one, it actually says uh, disused, it says ruined, ruined salmon station already in <laughs> 90, whatever. And here we've got the line, the original transit lines of the net that we would have lined up with the shore. I think this was lined up with Ulva. So when we dropped the anchors for the net, we'd motor out on a line on a transit and drop the anchors so that the, the net would always be at the right angle. You couldn't just, uh, there was a lot of knowledge involved over setting the net correctly. A badly set net would never fish. And there was another one off here. And the third one was down here. Taking the fish out the net would be the most enjoyable, but well, that's quite exciting. You come alongside, you're in the open, beautiful little wooden boat. We come alongside the net and you can actually see the flashes of silver of the fish swimming around in the net. So you get quite excited coming up. Then you release the uh, pole that holds the net open. You roll your sleeves up, fight the jellyfish off, pull the net up, open the bag and then it's quite tricky to flip flip the fish into the boat so they fall out of the net into the boat where they're thrashing about on the bottom you'll be familiar with this and then you have to uh, deal with them deal with them quickly before they damage themselves in the bottom of the boat so you give them a sharp rap on the head and that kills them you might come along and there's no fish in the net or you might find just a couple of heads in the net where the friendly seals already swum into the net and done your fishing for you. When the nets get dirty, by dirty we mean they get a lot of weed and algae growing on them. They don't fish well because the fish can smell them. They have to be clean. So we'd have to pull them in, bring them in, wash them in fresh water, dry them, repack them, take them out, put them back. It would take a good morning to get a net off. <laughs> And then a good day, a good afternoon to wash it. Yeah. They were made of nylon, of course, but we did have zip 
obviously at the beginning it's in the, there were big heavy cotton ones and there was actually big heavy cotton ones here when I was here that uh, the Camus Centre used to use as uh, decoration the chapel of nets as they used to call it so it would be outside so it'd be hanging up and you, you would you would hit it in, in line with the net so that it was a, a, a metal hoop. Did you have that here? Yeah, yeah. So and the, the with, a hand, seaweed out. with a handle and it, it, would, it would work its way down the, the, the net and so you would try, so when it was dry uh, then it would, it would crinkle off but when it was damp, it would be very difficult to get it off the net. Mm. So it would, it was a, as the water would warm up, the algae would grow more in the, in, as the season got later. And you had to change the nets more regularly. And it was a huge job, well, just keeping the nets clean. hole there. It's, <laughs> it's particularly round. Just the little shape they would make if the seals meant hold it. Really you can just imagine it. <laughs> and then sneaking through that so, hole. And the seals would just bust. Look at that, that looks they, like a they would just seal bust hole. straight through it because ah. they would just have the power to just go. So if, if there's a big load of jellyfish came in on the tide and got into the head, the bag head, the weight of the jellyfish and the strain on the net because of the tide on the jellyfish that would pull the net down so it would be it would be masses of weight that was actually inside the net that you would sometimes need to spend an hour or two hours getting the jellyfish out mm. you'd be leaning over the net because it, the, the, they would they could sometimes even sink the boys the, 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 so it would be under the water so once your net's set, you've got to be out there looking after it. Yeah. You can't just put it on out and forget about it. So I would have been here off and on through the summer uh, with various cousins, mostly hanging about. Um, my father worked with my grandfather for quite a period of years as well. So. I, uh, there was three cousins that were all about the same age, so we would all be here just making a pest of ourselves. But it was never, it never felt that we were a burden. Uh, our grandfather and our Auntie Anne always made it feel as if we were welcome and looked after us and um, paid attention to us and always made us feel as if we were being useful, whatever we were doing. Our job was to, when, the, when we would hear the boat coming, we would go down and watch and uh, Sandy's father would put his arm up for, eat, for the number of boxes that we were to bring down empty to the boat. So we had to watch the boat he, and he gave us the signal of, by raising his arm however many boxes he wanted down. <laughs> yeah, it just, it just felt a really comfortable place to be. I inherited, when I took the fishing over, I inherited quite a few relatives that would come down every Hang summer and, and assist all of the, the good assistants. And your dad actually used to come down uh, do the anchors with, of the boats. So. Uh-huh, and uh, sit on the point yeah. for an afternoon occasionally yeah. watching the net for yeah. us. The fish would be packed up in the boxes. It would be the boat would go around to Vanessa in the afternoon and if the tide was right you would go into the village because you could nip into the hotel and get a half pint. I remember John Cooper and I did that. Both of us probably were underage, I suspect. So that was a big event, getting your half pint. And then if it was the weather wasn't, if the tide wasn't right, you'd go into the big pier. And we'd go on the bus. And the bus complained after a while that the, the juice was coming out into the, the luggage compartment. So eventually they had plastic had come in and they were, a plastic sheet went into the bottom of the box to, to stop the juice coming out. But then it would go to Oban, and as far as I know, there was a, a fish train went overnight down to London, I think it would go, mm -hmm. because I think the fish was sold mostly originally in Billingsgate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And eventually, I think it may have been, and it was W.S. uncles and Robbie uncles, there was various politics of who bought this stuff. Yes. But uh, we got to go eventually. But you know what was really interesting was that, that at that time, to employ 
a full time a woman full time mm -hmm. to do that work was it was very it, it felt perfectly usual and natural but in some places it just wasn't at all oh exactly and he, but he had a very good uh, anybody who was sort of saying was implying there was something wrong he would always just say that he learned to fish off his wife his wife taught him to fish yeah, and he yeah, taught him to yeah, fish so yeah. and there was no answer to that and uh, and then he'd say great things about which is the best one I've ever had because <laughs> there's more to fishing than just brute strength there's a lot of technique and knowing where to put the nets yeah. it's great mm -hmm. it was great he was a great uh, he did my social standing no end of good. So here we have quite a few diaries going away back to the 1940s of my grandfather's uh, when he was uh, fishing for salmon at Camus. And uh, this, this here's an example of one uh, from 1954. That's 68, 68 fish all together, the three, the three boxes. Uh, I can't make out where where they were going, but that's 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 quite that's a very good day's fishing. Sixty eight fish on on one day, uh, and there's there's the ones going to Iona, four boxes. These diaries are full of of the records of of the salmon, the girls and sea trout that was caught and uh, <coughs> there's one there uh, uh, 20 grills two boxes and they're going to Iona I assume it's the hotels in Iona because uh, they were, because of transport difficulties back then it was easier to sell the fish locally my aunt Anne actually was the accountant and she counted up the money at the end of the week and did the did the books. Uh, so she was very much a great organiser and a big part of the business and she worked hard uh, at the uh, <coughs> at the salmon fishing with her father. It's just just amazing and it's really nice to have all those um diaries in in, in the family. Um the records of, of of salmon fishing, which is sadly, it's not with us now. So uh, <coughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's a it's a great record, and it's it's a piece of important social history, I think. Yeah. As the years progressed, the fishing got less and less, um, and it become it became less and less economically viable. So the the timing for fishing got more and more restrictive. Because then it was down to, you had to get them off by Friday yeah. evening. You couldn't, have, you couldn't fish on a Saturday. No. But that, that's, a, that's a salmon box, because there's, the, mm -hmm. there's the hinged end. Goodness. So when it came to an end, obviously there was nothing to do with the nets, so they just uh, stayed here. became history. Yeah, it became history. It's only so long you could read about your occupation being history before you realise <laughs> that in fact it is. The deep mysterious blue, laughing and crashing against the shore, dancing the tangle back and forth, crash, crash, crashing against the crooked rocks. Pulling the creels back on the boat, the fisherman's gloves grabs the rope, reflecting on the pulling tide. Crash, crash, crashing against the crooked rocks. As the seals sleep, the dolphins leap, herons head home while whales weep. Salty sea spray fills the air. Crash, crash, crashing, crashing against the crooked rocks. My gran was from Easdale and Peter Eyelid's 
the salmon fishing rights there. I've changed school and college. Uh, I'd asked actually for a job a few times, but there's loads of folk I never got. And then I'd actually got a job with the forestry for, for just for the, for the planting trees for the summer. And he phoned up and said, "Do you still want a job?" So I said, "Yes." So I never went to the forestry. And I, uh, so that's how I went. I did. No, he asked me to come here for Tushkin and for a few weeks. I went to Tushkin and then over to Eastdale and worked and come back. And I did a wee bit of, of his, his father was alive as well, he did a wee bit of lobster fishing, so I was doing a wee bit of that. And it really sort of started there, and it really just picked up as he went along. Now, Neil Carman, he'd been doing it probably about a year more than me. And we, sort of, we worked together, and then uh, for Peter on, on wee boats, then he went his own way. I didn't have a clue about fishing until I was 19. Uh, Eastdale was my first job, and I was in the Navy at the time. Apart from going to open, oh, when I when I was there, we had about ten nets. Like so that was quite a lot compared to Bertie, who had maybe three, and Tom Brunton at Carsig probably had three as well. So it's it quite it's a bit bigger. Yeah. We we fished lobsters through the winter, so I was I was full time. But the salmon season was just three months, maybe. The rest of the year we, we went lobster fishing, so I learnt it there. And I stayed with Peter a bit, well, a good few years longer, until uh, I thought I should be doing this for myself. And I plucked up the courage. I went, I went, I was, we were working out Ben Doran, uh, and I thought I'm going to have to go and see him. So I went over and I said, oh, I've got something to say. He said, oh, come in. And I said, oh, you're not going to like it. And he said, oh, what, what is it? I said, um, I'm leaving, I'm going to go moan. He said, good. And it just deflated me, and you said it's the best thing you can do. I said the job's always here for you, but you need to do it. And he was so nice about it, he was so good. Well, Peter, was, Peter was great, he was the best boss anybody could ask for, really. No, but he was, he was, he was good. He, t he told me a lot, he was, he was a good man, a nice man. My name is Roger Harvey, and I live in Finnefort. My first experiences were going out with an old boy in Benesson in uh, an 11 foot dinghy and fishing a few single creels and with him I caught my first lobster and his name was Peter John McAllister. Peter John was born up Loch Screeden in an encampment uh, at Kilpatrick. His father was a horse trader from Ireland but also fished herring. Well, he taught me an awful lot of things, but to do with the fishing, he taught me how to handle a small boat, how to strip down a seagull engine. And the greatest thing was he taught me how to mesh a net and make creels. And being able to mesh a net came in quite useful later on when I was working with trawl nets and things like that, they get ripped, although I'm no great expert at them, but yeah, I, I can struggle by. <laughs> he was very knowledgeable, and he was very knowledgeable in a small boat as well. He was, he was highly respected, because he always dropped off. If he caught any fish, he always dropped them off around the, the village. Uh, you know, so he, you know, he, was, he, was, he was always doing something as well. He had a big wheelbarrow with a metal wheel on it, so you knew he was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I was born just immediately after the Second World War and there was really no money in, in shellfish fishing. The salmon fishermen were the wealthy fishermen in my young day. Uh, and I know when my father came back home from the war, he, he couldn't make a living at, at fishing. And yet my grandfather before that had. He'd made a very good living at it. And then the war came along and of course, just like it's happening just now, a wee bit, things are getting in turmoil. Uh, so there was no record of shellfish or fishing, full stop, on Iona until I started, uh, after I left school. There was no competition. <laughs> you, you took that price or no price. 
and then in fact just six weeks ago now I was down in Fleetwood at a funeral uh, or a memorial service actually because a person had died in, in, uh, during Covid and that was for Andrew Wilson of Holyhead major buyer and up this west coast out onto Euston when he came onto the scene uh, that made a big difference because that was competition then Aye. and then you know Terry Terry Massey he, com he comes onto the scene and so on it goes so competition David Town uh, Town uh, and then Dave, David Lindsay thereafter Aye, David Lindsay from yeah. Auburn Aye. you know Spank yes Aye. well Spank was in school Alistair in Colbowie you know. Aye. Uh, and I could see that there was no great living to be made, continuous living at Lobsters alone. So we had to push to see if we could get a crab market started. And Big Ian McDonald, Ian John and Tom Murray, he had friends that worked for Young's Seafood. Uh, and through that and a whole lot of different connections, uh, we got in tow with the factory up in Inverbervie, Stonehaven. Uh, so we took Alistair and I took a sample of the crabs away up there in the transit van, and Ten I said and a half the crabs for free. Aye. All we asked the manager for was process them and tell us that it's poor crab before we leave. We challenged them to, mm -hmm. and we went and had a wee tour about and Aye. a bite to eat and came back up and that by that time they'd sorted through it all, they'd put it to the front of their production line, they'd sorted through everything, had a look at it and said, hmm, that's the best crab we've had this year. You must have been ruthless in your selection. And we just looked at each other and said, no, that's, that's, that's the crabs that's that we catch. Oh, West Coast crabs never as good quality as that. I said, well, that's what we catch. That was us. That's that just, was, this was it just starting, the crab uh, fishery. This is us. So out, out, of, out of that, because he had been in school uh, with Spank, uh, then we employed Spank with a tipper lorry, because mm -hmm. that's what he was starting out in his haulage business. Uh, and he was no peer for the big boats to, in Finnefer in those days, because there was no modern peer there. So we happened to land him in Essen every two days. Uh, and then we'd load Spank up, and he would go away up to Inverbervie and Aye. so on. So we did very well at that, eventually. Yeah. But the other thing it did, which I think is very significant, was for the Ross and Mull. It kept a generation of young fellas Aye. there, David. Aye, it did, yep. Mm -hmm. The starting of that crab fishing kept, Aye. Aye. I don't know how many. Aye. Aye, quite a few anyway. Aye. Well, there's two or three families dependent purely Aye. on the transport side of it, never Aye. mind the catching Aye. side Aye. of it. Because it all Aye. changed very quickly. Yep, Aye. Aye. I don't really know. I don't, I don't know. It's not, I wouldn't say it really has changed an awful lot. We still buy and sell. I mean, ele electronics has made made it easier. We, we, we can go further. The electronic charts and the, the depths are there, and the hardness of the seabed and everything. So you can just see go over the ground once, and your plotter will plot everything and see how hard it is. And and you no, know, you're, you're fishing whereas before. Uh, like likes of Davy and Iona, he they used to have to take marks of you know, their better ground. So they they take use the radar and just take two take you no know, take line of sights, and that's how they found their ground. I mean, we'll go 20 miles out to sea, and you can't see anything, even if it's a foggy day, and uh, you go straight to your float. It just just goes with just with the GPS. Well, sitting in the kitchen of last year or the year before. And, and Alistair started fishing with me in the old boat uh, when he was still in school. And we're sitting in there, and just like this, he quotes the course and the time Aye. to get to the end of Iona Sound. And he says, you've got to change course then this time to hit the Torn Rocks. I couldn't have told you that. It's in his head. Just like he quoted you the prices. from the moon, there, isn't it? 12 degrees west to south. <laughs> for 55 minutes, with, was it 55 minutes with the ebb tide and Aye. an hour and five with a flood Aye. against you? And then it was 17 minutes, bang on due west, out to the West Reef. Right. See. That was for foggy days, no radar. No radar. When, when the fishing was at its peak, there was 40 plus people, I think, uh, work, working at fishing, and, and they were all in their 20s, I would imagine. 
But now it's must have must be mostly in our fifties. No young ones coming into the game at all. Twenty years ago, twenty-five years ago, this, that's the school. Everyone fished. Uh, I was involved in fishing. Uh, we had three of a crew, and all the boats had you know, two, three people on them. Um, and that's what that's what. There's a big school role then, but since since then, it's you no, know, it has dropped an awful lot, uh, and hardly anyone's fishing anymore. And it's there's still there is still good money in it. The, the money's still all right. Just just to the market, but it's, it's getting hard just now, just the price of fuel, and uh, we've had a fairly good day today, but once I take the, the expenses off, it's, no, it's, not, it's still, enough, still enough to live on, but it's not the sort of money we were getting used to, we were getting spoiled a bit, but, but it's, it's still, all, still all right, but the fuel is just a, a killer just now, it's more than doubled in a year, it's more than doubled. What Neil was doing, catching stuff, small scale, straight to the local market. That's the future. Mm. Interesting the way he's done it. Yes, he's, very much so. He's looked Aye. at it with a very fresh Aye. pair of eyes. Aye. And, and looked at it from the market end, back the way. Aye. Rather Aye. than from the, now I've caught them, what do I do with them? Aye. But in Neil's case, and a lot of those other boats, well, you've got the wee kiosks and that over in Finnefer now. Uh, yep. That are doing very well supplying that market. And got him doing Javid, a bullock, a bullock, er a glatach, a dancer, er ash, er erst, a glackety, a glackety, er a cake and scotter, a tarring and clave, er ash, er a vatha. Graham and Esker are in Rob. Mjordahig are in Vurglan. A glackery, so a glackery, are in a creek in Skogham. At the vis na ron a chatel, leim na leimithirin. At the vis muchgan vare a kunig, chili a chore griach. Smooch na mara sanar. A glackery, so a glackery, are in a creek in Skogham. Well, Johnny was a fisherman and a waiter in his spare time, what little he had. I was a chef and uh, people would come and ask, you know, where can we get fresh seafood? And we'd have to tell them, well, uh, nowhere really. It goes straight on a truck and goes to Spain. Of course, we always ate fresh. I got fresh lobster. Johnny cooked me a lovely three course dinner involving lobster for our very first meal. So our, our future was assured. But we thought, well, that's a shame, and uh, why not, it was Johnny's idea, why not start a restaurant in our sort of abandoned old croft building? We decided, well, wouldn't it be great? It should take about six months, I figured, to get it up and running. And Johnny yes. says, oh, I think it's going to be a year or two. I said, oh, you're so pessimistic, and it was seven years to get funding and find a builder, and you know how it is around mm -hmm. here, but... Yeah, coming in with unknown buckets of weird things, uh, it, it is a challenge. Um, and spider crab lately, that's our latest one. What can we do with all this crab that nobody sells, eats, buys? And I just thought, well, Johnny thought we could use it somehow. So we are processing it, but it takes a couple extra hours out of our day. Um, so it is challenging from the time perspective, but seafood always has been uh, labor intensive on the processing front. But um, it's also exciting though um, to have sea urchin come in and one day Johnny will have like three octopus. It's always fun to see what he comes into the kitchen in his, his special magical bucket full of fun. But you like the mackerel. Oh, I love mackerel. And you love the Fresh creamy... Fresh mackerel is unbeatable. Perno spinach with the scallops, the Isle yep. Mull scallops on top. With I the like the whole lot, but perno my favourite is without doubt the crab. <laughs> yeah, but you can taste when food is made with love and when there's soul into it. And I think you've got to cook a dish. Winter time, a Sunday, mo Sunday breakfast treat is uh, hot buttered croissants with smoked lobster scrambled eggs. Yes, please, as you said. <laughs> I mean, you can look, only have to look at the number of folk that are doing seafood since we started. we have got the Creole started down there. The Keel Rose trying to do some seafood now. And, yeah, 
it's, it's massively popular. Without the seafood, our tourist trade would drop away. I mean, you only have to look at the queues outside Oggy's shack in Oban and to realise what a, a fantastic draw it is. And it's top quality stuff. I can see why there's no youngsters particularly keen to start the fishing, because it's bloody hard work. It is excruciatingly hard work some days, and it's dangerous, but the rewards are there still, you know. Um, if you work hard, you can, you can still earn a, a good, good living at it. Yeah, we need more fishermen and we need more chefs, young people. In the rest of the world, chefing is the new rock star. Now, it's, let me tell you, it's, it's not a glamorous occupation either. It is, that's, that's bloody hard work. And it you get to too. work for like, I get, you know, 14 to 17 hour days, but I do get the winters off, so I'm not complaining, but it's a hard graft. My first kind of introduction to fishing, I suppose, I was out in Australia and I was kind of working holiday bees out there and I started working for a, a fish company out there. They owned four or five different boats and the boats were long line boats so they were going away out for a couple of weeks at a time fishing for, for swordfish mainly. Uh, swordfish and tuna were the two main ones. I didn't work on the boats, I worked just in the sh on the shore side of things but we helped unload the boats. We helped with all the maintenance side of it. The main thing, I suppose, was when, when the boat got unloaded, we worked in the factory processing all these big fish and they were getting sent uh, mainly to Japan and, and America for, for the sushi market. I guess that was my first introduction to commercial fishing, which is strange because growing up here, there's there's plenty of commercial fishing boats here, but I never, I never worked on any. I didn't do any deckhand stuff here. It was only when I came back after being abroad that it was kind of an opportunity to do something with the fishing. And I thought, well, why not? I'll give it a go and see, see how I get on with it. There are certain things that are kind of similar. So that started me off, I suppose. And then when I came back here, like I said, it was actually Davy Kirkpatrick that, um, had he's got and he still has it this wee dinghy just a wee 16 foot orkney dinghy lovely wee boat and but she had a license he what he wasn't really using the boat and i said well would you be interested in me using it you know i'll take care of the boat and look after it make sure you know it's all it's all good and um, if i can kind of use it and you know use the license put stuff through the license and so he was happy with that and so that's how it that's how it started when I came when I came back to Iona. So when I first started fishing, I was going out uh, in the Golden Dawn, which is Davies the dinghy, and I was doing it part time. So I was working at the hotel as well. I didn't have many creels to begin with, so I'd, I'd got a few second hand ones. It was an open dinghy, so it didn't have a hauler in. So I was hand hauling all the creels. There's a quite a deep patch uh, they call, called the Tangle Hole which is out towards Staffa and uh, it goes down to I think the deepest bit in the charts 150 metres and I put I put a fleet of creels in there one time and I never did it again because to haul them back <laughs> to haul back up from 100 whatever metres it wasn't uh, it wasn't very much fun and I, if I remember rightly I don't think I got very many prawns out of it I just started off doing it locally to, to businesses mainly to begin with and then when I went full time with the fishing that was 2015 I then started doing a wee bit more advertising so I started actually you know looking to sell to Joe Bloggs off the street once I went full time at Osilu, I was I was selling to the, the two hotels in Iona the, the Hertz Centre Cafe sometimes to the restaurant here started doing a bit more private sales and that just kind of built and built. You know, anybody who ordered on Iona would always deliver whatever they'd ordered to them. I wasn't doing as much in Mull really up until, I suppose, really COVID hit, which sounds a bit strange, but um, basically when 
when COVID hit, the first lockdown, um, I had just got my new boat and so it took me a wee bit to get that ready to go. But then once it was, I guess because people were kind of locked down and also the hotels here went open, so I wasn't really having much business. So I was looking for an outlet to, to sell stuff more to private folks. So I started up a, a text message list, like a kind of mailing list on Mull, on the Russell Mull. Basically, I would go over once or twice a week and folk would come down to the pier and meet me. At the same time, I bought a massive big cool box and that's on the Iona side. And so now, if anyone orders anything on Iona, it gets put into that cool box and they come and collect it. So any orders that go to Mull, they just get dropped at the, the top of the pier at Finnefer and people come down and, and collect them and then just return the boxes to the same place. lot of silly memories. So whenever my Uncle Pierre comes up, he has like this fast bowl. And whenever I go on it, it's too fast. And one time when it was my Uncle Peter's birthday, uh, and when it was his birthday, we went to a beach and we went donutting on his bowl. My sister Ulla fell in the huge patch of seaweed and she came out with a giant crab like hanging around her neck. Um, well, it's quite nice when the boat's like bobbing about and the engine's not on because it's quite like, it's very quiet. Um, at one of my birthdays we went down to the beach and I, flew, I had my cousins and a friend up and we went down and my little sister, she was thinking around the sea, around the waves and things. And then she fell flat on her face in the actual water. And my auntie had to get her out. Whenever you want, you can kind of go out, do paddle boarding, snorkeling and stuff without having to really, like, do much. You can just kind of go out a lot. It's this one time which um, I was playing in the sea and um, I fell on my face and I got sand everywhere. My dad works on a boat, my uncle works on a boat, and then that, and my Shana works on a boat. And would you like to work at sea, do you think? Yeah. What would you like to do at sea? I'd probably like to be like a fisherman. <laughs> 